All right. Welcome, everybody, to our Tuesday night class at Bet Judo at 6.30 Avenue S at 8 p.m. Um, every Tuesday. So now we are going to speak. Right now it's Rosh Hashanah is coming up. We're still in Elul. And there is a saying with Elul is, I am to my beloved and my beloved is to me. Now, the obvious question that so many people ask is, is, what do you mean by love? What's this love? I am to my beloved and my beloved is to me. That's not something, you're coming up to judgment day. And if it's like judgment day where you're getting judged for the rest of the year, if you're going to live the year, if you're going to die the year, if you're going to make money, if you're going to get married, yada, 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 everything is happening in one day. What's the beloved part? You should be shivering in your pants. You'll be shaking. Be like, oh my God, what's going on? So, so to understand what it means to actually, you know, what does the word love mean? And people get this very, very confused, the word love. People usually, what they say, they say they fall in love. I mean, they say they fall out of love. They don't love you anymore. They used to love you. They forgot that they loved you. And, and everybody uses the terminology. And I think most people don't even understand what the word love actually means. Now, to understand the strongest possible love relationship, let me tell you this following story. This amazing story. There was uh, uh, two parents that were, that were up well past midnight in their, in their home having a conversation that no parent would want to have. And the conversation was between themselves thinking, what are they going to do with their oldest son? The oldest son by the name, goes by the name of David, and he was sort of straying from the family path. He was no longer you know, going through the family way. He was going off the dirt. He was not, you know, was hanging out with the wrong crowd. He was dealing with, uh, with drugs and alcohol and, uh, and other problems. And they just didn't know what to do anymore. They're like, what are we supposed to do? Should we kick him out? Should we, let him, should we keep him here? And they had no idea what to do with their son. So they were talking back and forth. And so the, the father said, listen, you know, we can't keep him in the house over here. He's bringing the whole family down. And then the mother said, well, what, we're going to let him outside? And what, now at least we know what he's doing when he's coming home. Who knows what's going to happen if we're going to kick him out? And the father says, we've got to think about the rest of the family. He's going to bring the whole family down. And they're going back and forth, back and forth, until finally they came to the decision and said, listen, he says, you know, we can't, we can't go on like this. We can't go on like this. He's going to bring everybody else down. It's not healthy for him. It's not healthy for us. All the fights that we're getting into with him, it's just not working out. So about 2 or 3 a.m. in the morning, the son walks in, reeking of smoke and other, other uh, uh, perfumes that uh, the parents usually don't like to smell. And he comes in, at, you know, in the wee hours of the morning, and the parent, and you know, he, he starts climbing up the stairs. And the parent says, yo, 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 Devin, why don't you, why don't you come down? Why don't you come back down over here? Uh, we want to have a talk with you. So he's thinking, oh, great. Now I have to have another, now I have to have another talk with my parents. What's going to be about drugs, about alcohol, about, you know, whatever else I do. So he goes and he sits down, and his father goes to him and says, uh, David, listen, we, uh, we love you. We love you very much. And because we love you very much, we cannot continue seeing you do go and destroy yourself. So what we are going to do is we are going to give you a choice. If you would love, and we would love for you to choose this choice, is stay home. Stay home in our house, and when you stay home, you have to follow our rules, the rules of the house. However, if you choose not to follow that, if you choose to follow the path that you're doing, you're going to have to do it elsewhere because we're not supporting you anymore in our home. And you know, the, so the son is looking at them and he says, uh, so you're telling me you're kicking me out. So uh, the father says, no, we, we don't want to kick you out. We want you to stay, but you have to follow our rules. So he goes over to his mother, the son, and he says, mommy, are you, are you in with, the, with this on that? So she, mother says, me and your dad are together in this. So he says, fine, you want me to leave? I'll leave. And he runs upstairs, grabs his, grabs a gym bag, and he starts stuffing all his clothes. He, caught, he, he you know, meanwhile, his parents are saying, no, cry, you know, his mother's crying, please don't reconsider. Just, just stay here and just go through the rules that we'll give you. And he says, I don't need this, I don't need you, I have plenty of friends. He packs his bag and he storms out of the house. He goes and he drives, drives his car, he drives to, the, to, his, uh, to his, he has two friends, two Jews that are completely irreligious, you know, um, and they go, he goes over to them at about four in the morning and he knocks on the door and he hears the music playing so loud and he's like, all right, they're not hearing me. And he just opens up, it's open. And he walks in and he sees Jay, one of his friends, sitting on the couch uh, watching TV. Uh, so he says, uh, so they're looking at, he, he looks at him, he comes in at four in the morning with a bag, uh, you know, like a luggage. So he says, uh, Dave, what's up with the bag? Are you moving in? So Dave says, you know, is it okay? Uh, I'm, I'm in between places right now. Is it okay if I crash here for a few days until I settle down? And he says, yeah, for sure, not a problem. He calls to his roommate, Mark, Dave is joining us. So Mark comes out, he's like, awesome, celebrate, you know, celebratory drinks. Brings out some drinks, everyone makes a nechaim, and those last uh, for, for quite some time until they all get plastered and they pass out. Uh, you know, he, so he starts living over there, and he's enjoying life. It's, rent, you know, he's, he's partying as much as he wants. No one's on his back. 
And, you know, slowly, slowly, he begins to drift even further away from religious than he was before. You know, there's, it says, you are what your friends are. You know, with, with the people that you hang out with are the people who you're going to be like. This is why such a big problem when people send their kids to public school, because they're going to become like that. Whether you like it or not, as much as you try to stay away from it, you are going to get influenced by it. And he got influenced by his friends, Mark and Jay. So slowly, slowly, things that he was observant with, which Shabbos he would always keep, you know, kosher he would always keep, but slowly, slowly, those things slowly drifted away. And for the past, uh, you know, few months, he kept on thinking, you know, should I call my mother? Should I call my father? Should I let them know that I'm okay? Because he didn't spoke, spoke to them. And he decided, no, you know what? I'm an adult. I made, a, I made a decision. Let me stick by it. A full year passes with no contact. Finally, um, you know, he, he, he picks up uh, some sort of work. He works in the afternoon so he could party, uh, you know, throughout the day, throughout the night, and he could still wake up, uh, you know, really late. So he goes and he wake, and uh, one day he's, he's on his way to work, and he steps outside, and to his surprise, he sees his father standing right in front of his car. So he's like, shocked, and it was too late to run away, and it's the first time he's seeing his father for a year, and he goes over to his father, and he says, uh, um, what's up, Dad? So he says, uh, hey, hey, David, how's it going? So he says, oh, everything's good, you know, living life, I'm good. So he says, uh, do, you, do you have a few minutes? Do you mind grabbing a cup of coffee with me? So he says, uh, so, you know, he didn't see his father a year. He felt bad. He says, yeah, sure, Dad, why not? Let's grab a quick cup of coffee. So they go to the coffee shop and they start talking. And, you know, the father goes over to him and he says, uh, listen, you know, I just wanted to come here. I, I'm not, I, he says, first of all, straight out, I didn't come here to change your mind. I didn't come here to bring you home. I just wanted to come here to let you know that, you know, your mother and I, we care very much about you, and, you know, we worry about you. And, we, you know, your mother's sick to her stomach, not knowing where you are, what you're doing at night, and you're healthy, are you eating okay, or what's going on with you. And, um, you know, we both love you very much, and that's what I wanted to come and tell you. And I have one request, he says. Uh, he says, can you please come with me now to a grave of a tzaddik that we could pray together? So, you know, this, you know, Dave, uh, what, you know, who's sitting over there is really touched by his father's words, but he says, listen, Dad, I wish I could, but I got to work, and I got to, you know, I'm going, I'm going tonight with the AC with my friends. Uh, you know, I got plans. I really can't, uh, I really can't cancel it. So the father, you know, as much as he rehearsed not crying, he tried not to. He reaches his hands over to, to, to his son, and he grabs his, his hands, and he looks in his eyes, and he says, please, David, please, for me, with tears streaming down his cheek. So... When he saw that, the, you know, his heart broke, the, the son. And he may believe he looked away, like, to not show his tears. And should try to get out of the awkward situation. He's like, fine, you know what, Dad? I'll come with you. Let me make some phone calls. So he quickly gets up, wipes his eyes, and makes a few phone calls. Cancels work, cancels his uh, friend, trips to, to AC. And they go, and they start walking to the father's car. They walk to the father's car, and he sees, you know, the family car that the father, the family had for a few years. And also, you know, brings back some memories. And, you know, his little brother sitting in the baby seat. And all the sisters are uh, screaming in the back. It just brought up back some emotional uh, memories. And they start driving. And they drive to this uh, to the cemetery. And the father goes and takes out two tilim. And he gives one to, to his son. And he takes one for himself. And they walk to this, uh, uh, you know, to the grave. They sit by the grave. They say a few chapters of tilim for about 10 minutes. And the father goes to the son and says, uh, you, you ready to go? So the son said, yeah, sure. And they go back silent, right? Go back silently, very awkward, very silent. And he pulls up in front of, uh, uh, in front of his apartment. And he goes to his... Uh, Dave is about to open the door to go to his apartment, and suddenly he feels his father's hand on his shoulder. And he turns around, and his father says, you know, David, says, no matter what happened between us, and no matter what will happen between us, I just want you to know that no matter what, you will always be my son, and I will always love you. So, you know, the guy said, you know, Dave, David was there, was like, you know, he nodded in agreement, and he closed, left the door and closed, uh, uh, and went upstairs to his apartment. He gets into his apartment, the apartment's dead silent, all his friends are, you know, it's late in the night, all his friends are partying in, in the AC, and he's looking around, and he's like, what did I just do, what did I mess it up? All my friends are having a great time in Atlantic City, and I'm stuck over here, you know, doing nothing. So he goes, opens the fridge, he sees some happy eaten food, he gobbles it down, drinks some flat soda, feels nauseous and disgusting, and he's like, you know what, that's it, I'm calling it in. And he plops down in his bed, turns on some music, and falls asleep. He falls asleep, and he wakes up with his phone ringing. And he gets, you know, it's like, in, you know, you when your phone's ringing in the middle of the night, all of a sudden you're like, he wakes up, you know, sees the sun is just uh, coming up, and he answers the phone, half sleepy and groggy. He's like, hello? And he's like, uh, um, and he hears someone screaming at the other side. He says, Dave, Dave, are, are you okay? And the guy's like, he's like, well, first of all, what are you screaming? He's like, what time is it? He sees like six in the morning. He's like, yeah, dude, of course I'm okay. I'm sleeping. What's up? He says, why are you calling me so early? And he's like, you didn't hear what happened? And he's like, you know, all of a sudden he wakes up. He's like, he's like no, what happened? He's like, and he's like, oh man, you know, and you know, he says, you know, I feel bad I have to tell you this to you, but uh, 
you know, Mark and Jay, your two roommates, uh, they were in a car accident last night. And he's suddenly he wakes up fully and he's like, he's like, are they okay? Where are they? I'm gonna go visit them. And the guy on the other line of the phone, he's like, he's like, no, uh, you don't understand. It, it was they, they went head first to a semi trailer. So he says, so he starts screaming. So what happened to them? Where are they? And he says, listen, buddy, I, I really feel bad that I have to tell this to you, but uh, the funeral is today, you know, at about 11 a.m. in Bar Park. So he says, uh, and he drops the phone. He drops the phone, and the guy on the other side is like, hello, hello. And he picks it up, and he's like, yeah, yeah, thanks for telling, letting me know. I'll be there. And he hangs up. And he's walking around in a daze in his apartment. He sees, you know, this is his best friend, the people he lived with for the past year. He looks, and he sees, you know, this guy's guitar, and this guy's sneakers, and this guy's, you know, they see all the things they kept on reminding him until finally he spoke to God for the first time in one year, and he started screaming at God. He's like, why? Why, God? What did these kids ever do to you that you need to take them? And he started screaming, and he started punching the pillows, and he was getting all frustrated, you know? And then, you know, he shed a few tears, and he built it back up, and he says, no, you know, that's it. And he goes, and he starts getting ready for the funeral. He goes, and he drives down to the funeral, and all in a daze. And he gets into the funeral, and he sees the two parents of Mark and Jay sitting over there, you know, and grieving. And the whole time he's thinking, my parents should have been here also. I was supposed to go with them in that car. I was supposed, to, I am supposed to be in one of those ca uh, caskets. And he's like, and, and, you know, he can't get over this. And he's, he goes through the entire funeral, all, it's all in a blur. And the funeral finishes, he pays his respects to the, to the family, and he drives home to his apartment. He drives home to his apartment, he looks around, and he's like, what, well, you know, what, what now? And he thinks for a few minutes, and he starts packing up all his stuff. Half in the days, you know, been holding himself back from like any emotion, as many men try to do. And he goes and he drives down to his, to his parents' house for the first time in a year. And he goes, he's about to walk up the stairs, and he's like, what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? And he's like, you know what? Screw it. And he goes on. He goes into his front door, and he knocks large, you know, very loud in there. And he hears, you know, a woman, which is his mother from the other side, saying, who's there? And he t says very loudly on the first time, it's David. And suddenly you hear someone run, open the door. And then they both freeze. He sees his mother for the first time in a year. And then she starts crying and she grabs him and hugs him and you know, and you know, he's sitting in his mother's embrace and then suddenly all the emotions that he was bottling up for the entire day just let it out. He started bawling like a baby. And then he started saying, you know, over and over again on his mother's shoulder, I'm so sorry, mommy. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry again and again and again and again. The father hearing the commotion from upstairs runs down and he says, what's going on over here? And the mother, you know, through a tear saying, David's home, David came home. And, you know, the father comes, he sees this, and he runs, and he gives over also, you know, the, you know his son a, a big hug. And the son, you know, with tears in his eyes, says, says Daddy, can, can you ever forgive me? I'm, I'm so sorry for all the pain and trouble I caused you. Can you ever forgive me? And the father says, of course, of course, everything is forgiven. Don't worry about it. We're just so happy you're home. And his all six siblings came running down, mm -hmm. and they came chanting, Dove, Dove, it's home, Dove, it's home, Dove, it's home. And the little kid was, everybody, it was like, it was like a reunion that they hadn't, uh, you know, ever dreamed of. This went on, and David slowly became a better person, and his next time that he packed up his bags when he went to Israel. He went to Israel to learn yeshiva for two years. He came home, and he, became, he got married uh, shortly after he came home. And shortly after that, he was blessed with a baby boy. And in the hospital, he's sitting there, you know, the, 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 his wife just gave birth to a baby boy, and for the first time that he gets to hold his son, which is a feeling that I cannot explain. Only you can, the first time that you hold your child is an, you can't, you can't even, only a father could explain that feeling. And he takes his child in, in his hand, and with tears in his eyes, he goes to the child and he says, he's, he goes to this little boy, and he says, no matter what, you will always be my son. And I will, I will always love you as my father always loved me. And he gave him a kiss on his head. Anita Dodiva Dodili, I am to my beloved and my beloved is to me. That's the month that we're in now, and that's what we're coming to Rosh Hashanah. That means that what? That a, a love. What's a real love? A parent to a child. And no matter what the child does and what the child did, a parent will always love the child. No matter what, a, parent, a child can always go back to his loving parents' embrace and they will accept it. This is the month that we're going to right now. This is the month that we are in right now leading up to Rosh Hashanah. This is the love that we're talking about. God is our Father in Heaven. He loves us no matter how far we went back. All He's asking us is come home. The second you come home, you're going to get a great big hug and you're going to say I'm sorry and He's going to say it's all forgiven. Don't worry about it. I'm just so happy that you're home. Now, what is this relationship of parents with children? A parent-to-child relationship is a relationship of giving. There's no taking by a, pa by a child. A parent's not expecting anything from a child. What happens is the, the, the true loving relationship, and this goes to any relationships, marriage, children, friendship, a relationship means that you're giving. Not that you're receiving. If you're giving and receiving, and that's what your expectation is, then you're not in a relationship, you're in a partnership or a business you know, partnership. You're, you're saying, okay, I'll give you this, 
and you'll give me this. A best friend that starts counting how many times he did you favors versus how many times you did him a favors, you should find a new best friend because he's not a best friend, he's your partner. And just you're, he's doing something for you on the condition that you do something for him. The love, the love relationship of the Most High is when you give. You give, you give, you give, and then it will be the other person who gives and gives, gives back to you. This is how the relationship between us and God to work. We should not be going be like, all right, God, bless you. I became a Baal Tshuva. I started listening to you. Where are all the miracles? Show me the miracles. Show me the money. Show me everything. Where is it? And that's not the relationship that you're looking for. You're not looking for a partnership with God. You're looking for a love relationship. You want to give, 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 and then you'll get, get, get. God will give you. The, the Torah says, right, in Bukul, if you follow my paths, you will have a good life. You will be blessed. If you don't, you won't be blessed. That's as simple as it is. But it's not in the condition. I'm not going to do this on condition to do that. I have many people ask me, I'll be like, okay, can I make, a, can I make a, some sort of agreement? I'll do this for X amount of months, and then I'll see if God reciprocates. I'm like, what, you want to, you, that's the relationship that you want to have? You want to have a partnership? Now, I don't think that's a partnership you want because you're in a lot more debt than, than, uh, than, than you think you are. This is the, this is the strong, this is what people come at Rosh Hashanah. They come Amazon shopping. It's that they have a list. They take out a scroll, you know, and be like, God, I want to get mad at this. I want to be a millionaire. I want to, I want to have a lot of kids. I want to buy a big house. I want to buy a yacht. I want to buy a boat. I want to, blah, 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 all these things. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Right? How many times do you actually say, thank you, God, for the amazing year I just had? Thank you, God, that I'm still alive. How many times do you appreciate? How many times do you just give? And then God will give you back. I'm not saying you should not ask. You should ask on Rosh Hashanah. You should ask, you should ask for things. You should ask personal prayers. But that's not the point. The point is it's a love relationship. This is what we're dealing to, wedding to Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah, you think judgment day. Nobody likes to get judged. Even people, let's you know, Mr. Olympia, right? I'm sure he's nervous when he gets judged. You know, all this uh, Miss America pageant. They're not like, ooh, I'm, I'm so happy that people are sitting and judging me. Nobody likes to get judged. But yet, parents are always judging their children. You ever realize that? Parents are always saying, what are you wearing? You're going to go out like that? It's very cold. What are you going to eat? You have any food? Parents are always nervous about food, right? What are you, who are you hanging out with? What are you doing? What, 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 what? And they say, come on, leave me alone. But what would be the flip side? If let's say a parent would not bother you, let's say a parent would leave you alone, that shows that they don't really care. They don't really care. By a parent constantly going and constantly judging you, constantly saying what's, that means that they love you. And by us getting judged by God, that means that God cares about us. God says, no, I care about you, and that's why I'm judging you. But when, it's not a punishment uh, to try to avoid, and because you, know, you messed up, I'm angry, I'm going to get pissed off at you. That's not the relationship that, that's going on. What happens is, is that if somebody does bad, sometimes you need a little reminder, like a parent. Sometimes a person, kid needs a time out just to you know, set him straight. We're coming to Rosh Hashanah, but we're getting judged. We're getting judged as a father judges a child. As a father judges a child in the most loving way possible. It's all about the love. Now there's two ways, there's a few ways to walk into to, to Elul and, and Rosh Hashanah. There is, when, when uh, uh, you know, there are people that you think of Elul and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait till this day is over. I can't wait till, uh, the, all, and then I gotta fast. And there's gonna be a fast day after Rosh Hashanah, and then there's another fast a week later. Oh my God, I can't. How am I supposed to deal with this? And they get so nervous about it, and they just can't wait to be over. This is comparable. I'm gonna give you three scenarios. A um, a child is, and a, a father goes away in business for a short while, and he comes home, and you know he sees his adult child for the first time, thinking maybe he'll get, hey dad, hey what's up, how's it going, give him a nice hug. You know, like a manly hug, which is a half a hug, you know, as opposed to the mother, they get a full hug. So he's like, I'll get something out of him. And he walks past his son, his teenage son, his son does the little grunt, you know, or it's, the, you know, in the puberty stage, so, you know, like a little bit of a course in between the, so he's going in there and he's like, he's like, oh, that's it? He's like, yeah, all right. And in the son's head, he's thinking, oh, great, dad's home. Now I have to be on my best behavior, I have to make sure I brush my face, shower, blah, blah, do my homework, all that, whatever. Oh, I can't wait till he goes out again. That's one scenario. Imagine another scenario. The father comes home after a long trip and he, hear, he opens the door and he hears a little shriek from the back of the house. And it's his little two-year-old daughter screaming, Daddy's home! And he hears like a little pit patter, and they're like, da, 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 running to the thing. He runs to the, and she gives him the biggest hug, and she like just holds him so tight. No matter how bad his day was, and no matter how much he, you know, went through, everything's okay now. Everything, and her, in her mind, everything's okay also. Daddy's home. Daddy's home. There's, this is two ways that people can go into Rosh Hashanah. This is a time where it says, Dil Shoh Hashem Bin Matzo. 
seek God where he can be found. He can be found right now in this time. Until after Allah Shana Yom Kippur, he is coming. He is close to us. We could, this is the easiest time to do Shabbat. This is the time to do repentance because he is so close. Daddy is home. Now, how do you feel when daddy's home? Be like, oh man, now I have to be in my best behavior, right? Because if I'm not going to be in my best behavior, then I'm have a terrible year, right? There are many people, I don't want to sleep on, I'm not going to sleep on Allah Shana because then I'll have a sleepy year. Th that's not, yes, you shouldn't. But then what are you doing with the rest of the time? Talking, playing games, say to Yileen, do something with your with yourself. Now you you should be excited that God's home. You should be so happy. I'm like, God's home, Daddy's home. It's awesome. Then there's a third option. The third option is when the father comes home and the child completely ignores him. It's like, ah, as if he does, it's not even here. And this is the worst. This is the worst. This is somebody coming to Oshana Elut, thinking just another holiday. It's barbecue. Thinking that absolutely no difference than any other day of the week. No difference. It comes at Lula and people don't even change. They don't even do anything. That's like, that's like somebody, a father coming home and they're just completely ignoring, completely ignoring the parent. Father says, at least acknowledge me. Even if you don't, well, you're not happy, at least acknowledge me. And unfortunately, there are, you know, many, many people in that category. It comes at Lula, comes to Rosh Hashanah, and it comes and goes. Eh, whatever. It's another holiday. Oh, they eat some fish head and they eat some pomegranates and they eat some carrots and they'll, they make some jokes. Oh, salary, let's eat a celery, you'll raise my salary. No, they'll make uh, these, these stupid little jokes. Even though there's, we'll speak about it soon, there's actually, you know, there's, there's a big reason why we're doing all these simanim. But, but they go through it like nothing. You're getting judged today. You're getting judged, but not by anybody, by a father who loves you. And always asking you to come towards him and he'll give you that big hug and a great, great year. There's something else that, uh, um, that you know, people miss out on, and, and that is, comes, comes judgment day, and people are always thinking about the future. They don't even stop and saying, well, what about the gratitude about everything for the past year? Now, in, in a parent-child relationship, when does the child actually appreciate everything that the parent did? Once he becomes a parent. Once he becomes a parent, he suddenly realizes, be like, oh man, this is a lot of work. Be like, my parents had to wake up for me and change my diaper and do all this so many times. They are like, you know, a zombie after the first few months that you have a baby and you're like walking out, you're like, putting coffee in your IVs and you're like, you know, you're, you just can't function. You're taking all the pills possible to keep you awake and be like, how is this even possible? And then, you know, and then it's like, and then you think for a second, be like, wait, my parents, you know, had six kids. How did they do that? That's awesome. And then you start appreciating. Once you look back retroactively, you could start appreciating it. This is what, this is the time of the year when you could stop for a second and be like, what do you appreciate for the past year? What do you appreciate for things that happened the past year? There's so many things that you have to be thankful for, for that you're, just for one, that you're still around here. Now, there are many people that think only negative, unfortunately. And there, there was once a professor, and this professor came in on the first day of, of her class, and she took a nice, big, shiny whiteboard, and she took a marker, and she drew a dark circle inside it. And she goes to the class, and she says, uh, what do you guys see? So, you know, once a guy raises his hand, and he's like, oh, black dot. And she's like, all right, anything else? And he's like, uh, not really, you know, and people are trying to look at it and they look at it cross-eyed and they're like, I don't know what we want, but we're looking at it over here. And from one place to another, every student says black dot. So she says, is there anything else besides a black dot that you see it over here? So they, so they said, no, uh, we, we see only a black dot. She said, what about the white shiny paper, a shiny, a shiny uh, you know, backboard behind it? She says, how come nobody saw that? How come everybody focused on the small negativity, but nobody looked at the, at, the, at the amazing benefit? There are many things that happen in our life that are amazing, but we only focus on the little negativity. And that's why some people, they'll have one bad thing happen to them, the whole day is ruined. They're like, What's, what about all the other great things that happen? Why are you letting that ruin your day? Why are you letting that ruin your year? There are so many great things that, a person, that, pe that happen to people's life throughout the year. And the, the important point is, and now's the time, to take, don't look at the black dot. Look at all the white around it. Look at all the amazing things around it. You have a house. You have a family. You have a panasa. You have, you know, you have a roof over your shoulder. You have food on the table. Whatever it is that you have, you got married. You're getting married. You're dating. There's something. You're healthy. You're not depressed. There's so many things that you can look at that you could be happy for. Now's the time to be like, you know what? Thank you, God. You know, I, this is a great year. There's a lot of great things that happened this year. I want to thank you for that. Before I ask for everything, I just want to say thank you. You're awesome. I love you. Thank you. Now, the next thing is, is uh, always good to know the judge. And uh, you, know, I mean, you might have heard some of these uh, stories before, but it's important to, to reiterate these. So imagine somebody goes and gets uh, a ticket, and, you know, gets a, he gets a summons in a faraway country, and he's really nervous because he knows they're really strict. So he's, he's like, you know, and he's running late to his court date, and he finally gets in there. He barges in a half hour late, and you know, the judge does this thing, you know, you know and he's like, great, you know, that's it, it's done. He's like, all right, just cuff me now and just, you know, just let's skip the whole thing. And, you know, he's like, it's over. And the judge is stern and everything is like, oh, why'd you do this? Why'd you do this? Now imagine another scenario. You come in, you're running late, and you walk in, 
And you're like, wait, that guy looks so familiar. Look at the judge. And you get closer and closer, and you're like, wait a minute. And he's like, you know, is that you? And, you, and he's like, back to you, he's like, he's like, Mikey, is that you? And they go, you guys were best friends growing up. And you're like, you know, catching up. And meanwhile, the police officer who gave you the summons is like, he's like, oh, what's going on over here? He's like, oh, he's like, what's going on here? This is my best friend. I haven't seen him in like 17 years. And so the judge is like, all right. So he goes to the police officer. What's the problem over here? So he's like, eh, what are, you know, ah, whatever. It's not, he doesn't want to mess with the judge. You know, he's something that he sees all the time. He'd be like, if you, your guys are so close, he'd be like, eh, don't worry about it. It's nothing, you know, it's nothing big. He's like, oh, he did this thing, but let's leave him off with a warning. Be like, yeah, yeah, warning is good. And he goes, right? The more that you know the judge, the better off that you know the judge, the better off that you are in the, in the court case. You're coming, to, you're coming to judgment day. Know the judge. Know the judge. The judge is God. Don't come there and be like, what's up? And everybody will be like, who is this fool? We've never seen you before. Like, you've never entered a synagogue. You have never prayed. You never did Shabbat. Like, what, what's going on over here? Like, what did you do? Like, who are you? This is a, this is a um, you know, as an example. There was once a, uh, there's once a, a rich guy that used to give a lot of charity, but then he fell some hard times, so he put a sign on his door in like 17 different languages that like nobody will be like, no new charities, only old charities at this point. So uh, he goes and somebody's walking, you know, he has a beggar that, that walks around and he, uh, he sees a sign, never been in that town before, he sees a nice big house, sees a sign, thinks for a second, and walks up, knocks on the door. The rich guy opens up the door, you know, looks at him, and he knows he's never seen him before. And he steps outside to see if the sign is still standing. He looks at the sign, and he looks back at him, and he looks at the sign, and he's like, you, uh, you, reading, you read any of this? And the guy's like, uh, yeah, yeah. And he's like, no new charities. And he's like, all right, okay, thanks. And he just, beggar, just walks away. Guy, rich guy's like, whatever, all right, you know, weirdos. <laughs> so he closed the door. This beggar goes, makes a lap around the block. Walks around the block. Ten minutes later, and knocks on the, guy, the rich guy again. The rich guy opens up, and he says... What are you doing over here? He says, I, no new charities. And be like, what are you talking about? We know each other. We met before. He says, charity? So the guy was like, uh, so the rich guy was like, you know what? I like you. You got, uh, you, you got some webos. All right, all right. Give you some charity. And he gives him some charity. The trick is, don't come and watch for the first time to the synagogue. Hey, God, I'm here. Like, I've never seen you before. Come a few days beforehand. Come a little bit beforehand. At least something. Change something we're going to speak about soon is something that you could come to God and be like, I'm a changed man. And we're going to speak about that in a few minutes. The, the, um, it, it is very important you know, that when, some, when a bad thing happens, unfortunately, to somebody, it's very difficult to change it once it happened. It's very easy to change it before it happens. I'm talking about it in, in the heavenly spheres. It's easy to prevent the tragedy before it happens and actually after it happens. And you can understand this from, from, this, uh, from this example, from the story. There was once a guy... Um, that uh, he lived in a, in a, it was like two neighboring countries that were at war with each other. So they were, there was a, there was a, uh, a border between them. And the problem was in, the, in one country, the nearest cemetery was well in, in the middle of, it was very far. And the closest cemetery would be right across the border. So the people made, they made like some sort of, uh, you know, like a deal. I said, listen, you know, we're at war and obviously, you know, there's borders and there's like crazy stuff going on, but can we at least bury our dead in your, you know, at, at, your, at your cemetery? Because it's, it's just too much to carry them other places. So the guy says, listen, we're not monsters. We hate you, but we're not monsters. But yeah, why not? Okay, go. Bury the chabot. You have to go through customs and through all the patrols and everything like that. And I said, fine, they made a deal. So meanwhile, whenever there's, whenever there's uh, um, you know, these wars between countries, if you want to bring something between countries, you have to pay an exorbitant amount of money in fees just to transfer it because, like, no, you know, we're at war. So if you really want to bring something over that one country has the other one doesn't have, you're going to have a very difficult time doing it. So one guy is over here sitting over there, and he's thinking, he says, you know what? He says, I see a good business opportunity over here. He says, if we could go and we could sneak merchandise in a coffin, and we could go back and forth and, you know, as much times as we want without anybody knowing the better. And, you know, he got a few of his guys together. They made some investments, and they started doing this business. And, you know, the soldiers kept on seeing the same people again. They were like, yeah, how many families do you have? That, what's going on? Why are you always here? And he says, oh, whatever. You know, there's a lot of people we know. We help them, and we do that. And the, the soldiers are like, all right, fine. And suddenly the soldiers are like, something's weird over here. Something's weird over here. And um, the next time they come to the border, they're like, all right, open the casket. And then suddenly everyone's like wide-eyed and be like, oh, what do you mean open the casket? So they were like, oh, we want to see what's inside. Like, Come on, it's a dead person. You're going to look at it. Nice. Uh, cover, the, cover the mace. You can't. You can't. And then, you know, they're saying, no, it's, it's against our religion. It's against our culture. It's against this. Da, 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 da. Nothing was helping. The soldier says, something's fishy over here. You guys, you know, you look too happy always going back and forth this thing. You, they, open the casket. So they force him. They open the casket. They see it's full of merchandise. They bring him in front of the governor. 
the governor looks at them and he reviews the case and, and they start crying in front of them because they know this is death penalty. This is like treason and this is like who knows what. So they go, they start crying in front of the governor and says, you know, please have mercy on us. So the governor looks at them and be like, you fool. Now you're crying? You're crying. Had you cried beforehand when you're crossing over the guard, the guard wouldn't have suspected anything. You should have cried beforehand. Now you're crying now. It doesn't help anymore. You're already too late. That's why some people, they cry. When they cry, when bad things happen. The point is you cry beforehand. You pray to God that you should have a good year. You pray to God that you should be blessed with a, with a happy and successful year. Don't wait till bad things happen, till things go wrong, and then you start, you start praying. Granted, you should. You should pray when things go wrong. But you have to have a little bit of brains in your head and, and go a little bit earlier. There is, uh, you know, you want to have a good judgment, right? What, what, what are the things that you need to do? So it says, Tshuva, tfila, utztaka, ma'averin, etroa, gzera. Which means is, Tshuva is repentance, tfila is prayer, and staka is charity, remove a bad decree. Do you want to remove a bad decree? Those are the secret ingredients for removing a bad decree. Repentance, charity, and, and prayer. So now listen to this. This, uh, you have to stay with me a little bit, because uh, um, we're going to go, you know, a little bit deep. There is a pasuk, that, uh, let me first explain how it works. There is uh, things that you could use as an acronym. For example, um, let's say, and this is an example that I used before, and I don't know why I keep on using it again, because it makes absolutely no sense. But let's say, for example, car, right? So you could say catastrophic atomic repercussions, right? If you realize, catastrophic C, atomic A, repercussions R. They spell out car with the first initials, right? So Elul, which is, which is the month that we're in, and coming up to that, can also spell out something, and it spells out in the psukim, in the Torah. And there's three of them. And I'm going to go through each of those three things, and we'll see if it maybe gives us a secret until so, uh, to get a better judgment. There is a pasuk in Estelle. In Estelle, Megillat Estelle, in chapter 9, verse 22, it says, Ish l'rayeu u'matanot le'evyonim. Ish aleph l'rayeu lamet u'matanot vav le'evyonim lamet. What does that spell? Elul. What is, it, what is this particular pasuk speaking about? Matanot le'evyonim, giving, giving presents to the poor. Charity. Here's his first, first hint. Where it says Elul in the Torah, in the, in the first letters, it's referring to one, one place so far, is about charity. All right, so now we have charity on the side. Now the next one in the Devarim, the Deuteronomy, chapter 30, verse 6. It says, Umal Hashem et elokecha, et aleph, levavcha lamed, ve'et vav, levav is another lamed. Again, Elul. What is this referring to? The, uh, uh, service of the heart. What is service of the heart? Is prayer. It says, it says um, Abu Dash Balev is prayer. So here, the second time, well, this, 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 that we brought is that speaks about Elul, speaks about the month before Al Shana, is speaking about prayer. Now, the last one, which is, which is the most famous one, is in Shira Shirim, chapter 6, verse 3, which is Ani Ludodi Vedodi Liv. In translation, it means I am to my beloved, and beloved is me. Ani Aleph Ludodi is Lamed, Vedodi Vav Li Lamed, again Elul. The same thing Elul, and here is referring to Chuba. Now, if we can say this, this is, a, this is a, you know, I, I'm, I'm a stretching a little bit, my own thing, and if, if uh, and Bezat Hashem, let's reveal an unbelievable uh, uh, secret to this. I need the Dodi Vidodi, I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. It's sort of like, I just do want to do for you, and you want to do for me. It's, it, that, that's a sort of relationship. Now, the Ben Ishchai, in Pirkei Avot, chapter 2, says, listen to this, Aser make his will your will, Kedeshi Aser Ritzoncha Kirtzonah, so that he will make his will, your will. Now, what does that mean? Says the Ben Ishchai explains it. Let me, let me translate that to you. You make your will, you make his will, your will, so that he will make your will, his will. This is referring to God. Now, the Ben Ishchai says this is referring to particular repentance. And he brings it like this. Ben Ishchai, unbelievable tzaddik with the chidushim that he has. You could just go high off his chidushim. So listen to this. It says, look, his will, what's his will? His will is repentance. Your will is to sin. Make your will, his will. Make your sin, which is what you want to do, his will, which is repentance, which means repent like you want to sin. You make your will. And then what's going to happen? Then he's going to make your will, which is the sin, his will, which is a merit. And we know what happens. If you, if you sin and you do true out of love, then your sins turn into merits. So it says over here, the secret over here in this, in this Mishnah, in Pakeh Avot, make your will his will. You're going to do tshuva on your sin. By doing tshuva on your sin, he's going to make his will your will. Well, and he's going to make your will his will, which means he's going to turn your sins into merits. And, and this is very similar to what we're talking about over here. I need, I am to my beloved, and beloved is to me. I'm doing for him, and he's doing for me. But not in the way that I'm expecting that, but just in the way that I do, I do, and then he does, he does. And this is referring to repentance. The secret of these psukim, it's already told you before Rosh you know, Yom Kippur, said Mitchat, we know, we start screaming. We scream at this in the prayers. But we already got the secret already way before that. In Elul, the, the secret was already there. Be like, don't wait for that. Start early. Chuba, repent. Staka, give charity. Very important time, give charity. Give, 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 give a lot now. 
And tefillah, pray. Pray now. Don't wait to pray till the till, till Yosh Hashanah comes and then you're going to wake up and start praying. Pray earlier. Now, you want to go into, you want to go into Rosh Hashanah, you want to go to, to, uh, um, to Rosh Hashanah, you want to show something. You did something different. Now, this is the part that we'll talk about a little bit about change. Very interestingly, from the day that Elul begins until Yom Kippur is 40 days. Now, 40 is a very common number in Judaism. It comes up a lot. And I'll, I'll give you, and we'll go through some, some of them. Mabul, 40 days. It rained, 40 days. Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, rain, uh, I'm sorry, was, was given in, it was 40 days. Then you have me'ima, which means there's a person, a baby, when it, it's in its mother's womb. There is a time where you can tell, there's a time where you can pray for a boy or a girl up to 40 days. Because after 40 days, the body is formed in a certain way that you can tell already if it's a boy or a girl. So until then, once it's, if you know it's a boy, you can't pray that it should be a girl. But if you don't know yet, which means if it's not yet formed, you could still pray. So up to 40 days is where, where, it's, where it starts forming. You could decide what, that, that you could see already what it is. Then you have mikveh. Mikveh, when you go to the mikveh, it has to have a, an amount of water called a 40 saw. It's a saw is a measurement. It has to be 40 saw. Malkot, 40 lashes. Midbah, 40 years. We see a lot of things that have to do with 40. But there's a secret over here, and I don't know if you realize, if you are following along, all of them had to do with mem. We said mabul, matan Torah, meimo, mikveh. Malkot, Midbar, everything started with a mem. What's the numerical value of mem? 40. 40. The numerical value of mem. Now, what is so common on all these things? What is so common on everything that we just said over here? Listen to this. Mabul, what happened to Mabul? God dipped the whole world in the mikvah. It changed the world from, pure, from impure to purity. Matan Torah changed the world from where there was no Torah, for now there is a Torah. Me'imo, when a, person, when, a, when a kid is inside his mother's stomach, 40 days changes from when you're nothing yet, and now you're something, you're a boy or a girl. Mikveh, you're changing, you're, you're changing. You were before pure, and now you're, you're before you were impure, and now you're pure. Malkot changes your behavior, you're getting lashed, so you're changing it. Midbal changed the nations of the Jewish nation from a, from a, from a slaves to free. The men and all these things represent one thing in common, and that is change. And that is something very interesting if you realize you have to deal a lot with water when you, when you want to go to mikveh is water. What's water in Hebrew? Ma'im. There's a mem at the beginning and a mem at the end. It's surrounded with, with change. And then so if you realize water is also an interesting secret because ma'im, you have two mems and one yud. And it's similar to the H2O. You have two H's and one O. Two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom to combine the, the molecule, the compound, or whatever it's called, of, a, uh, of, a, of, a, of water, of H2O. What is water? Water is something, and we said this before, but it's so beautiful. Water is something that it changes. It always adapts to the vessel that it's in. No matter where you pour water, it's going to adapt. It's going to change to whatever the vessel it needs to be. More than that, water always, always goes down to the lowest possible place, right? In, in, uh, in the four basic elements of, cre of creation, um, I shouldn't say of creation, the four basic elements that we have, right, is earth, fire, air, and water. Everything tries to go, go up except the down. I'll give you an example. You light a match, right? The flame is going up. Now let's say you turn the match upside down. The flame is still going to be going up. Flame always goes up. You take, uh, you take dirt. You take a cup of dirt and you pour it. What's going to dirt going to do? It's going to start piling itself in the, into a pile. You take ear. Ear forcefully also rises. Oh, it also rises. It goes it forcefully. Water is the only thing that seeks to, to its lowest possible state. If there's a little bit of an incline, you'll see the water travel down. You want to know if your, ba your floor is balanced? Pour a little bit of water. You'll see if it, if it moves. If it moves, that means it's tilting down. Water always goes to the lowest possible place. It has the trait of humility. And that's why if you want to change, there's one thing that you need to do to change, is you have to be humble. Because if you've got too much pride, you're not changing. This is very important in marriage and very important in any relationship. If you have too much pride, which is bizarre to my class that I want to do in itself in its entirety, oh, pride. Water changes. You want to change? You want to go to mikveh? You want to be pure? Go to the water. Why water? Because water represents humility, and water represents change. That's why you're going into. Why? That's why you're going into that. That's why in the psukim, in, right in the beginning of the Torah, it says, "God's spirit." Where is it hovering? It's hovering right above the water. Why is it hovering, hovering right about, above the water? And that's because God stays where people are humble. Where you're arrogant, God's not staying. God's staying where people are hum humble. Now is the time to change. You're coming before Rosh Hashanah. Now is the time to change. So now the question is, what should you do? What are you supposed to do? So now, there is uh, many. What I recommend is take something small that you could stick to it. Listen to this amazing story. There was once a little four-year-old boy who, his mother passed away when he was young, and he was living with his father. He was an only child, and his father was a lead engineer in a, um, in a uh, radiology uh, plant, nuclear plant, I'm sorry. And he had a lot to do with, uh, there was a lot of uh, radiation and radiology near his work, and he had to live near his work. So they made like a fence near the plant that you cannot pass this fence. Right? The fence breaks, obviously, you know, it wasn't upkept so well. So... 
the father goes to his son and he says, you know, listen, you come home to school a little bit earlier than me, than I, than I get home. You hang around, you know, the neighbors will watch you, play around with the neighbor's kids, but do not pass by this fence because this fence is, is, is very dangerous and you cannot play over it. Now what happens if you tell a little kid, don't do that, no. they'll do that. So he says, okay, daddy, no problem. And he goes, and for a year, he was okay. And he's getting older, five, six. And then he's like, you know what? He says, it looks like a lot of fun where I can't go. And he starts playing where he can't go. And every time the father comes over, he starts screaming at him. He's like, no, you can't go there. It's so dangerous. You can't go over there. And the guy says, oh, the kid says, okay, daddy, for sure, for sure. I won't do it again. And a week goes by, and he's back playing over there again. Two years go by, and he's about eight, nine years old. And the kid starts complaining about, um, you know, he has headaches. And so the father gives him some time and all. And he goes back to, you know, he's so involved in his work. He's, he's having a very hard time to juggle both family and work life. And he goes, and the, fa and the, and the kid is having, uh, you know, the headaches are increasing more significant. And then he's like, um, you know, and then he starts getting nauseous. And the father says, you know what, let's take you to the, let's take you to the doctor. He goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, ah, it's nothing, it's probably some sort of flu, a bug. Uh, give him some more Tylenol, and should go away within a week or so. And he goes away, and it's a week, two weeks, three weeks go by, and the headaches are getting worse, and the, the nausea is getting worse, and he's starting to vomit. And he's like, no, something's wrong. And he brings it back to the doctor. The doctor says, listen, he looks fine, you know, let's run some tests. And they, they send him through some CAT scans and uh, MRIs, and this kid is going through all these tests. And, uh, you know, when they get the results back, he, call the, he calls the father in and he says, I need you to sit down for this. And the second father hears that, they're like, oh, oh no. You know, so he sits down over here and he pulls up the, the, you know, the results on the, on the whiteboard. And he says, um, he says, your son has a huge tumor in his head. And he says, we're going to have to do like aggressive chemo to even, even try to get anything. Aggressive, you know, try to, try, try to save him. And he's like, he's like, you know, you know, he's like broken. He's like, this is my only, what am I supposed to do? He's like, so he goes and he quits his job and he dedicates the, the rest of his time just taking care of his only son. And he's spending day in and day out and this kid, you know, you know, he's going through chemo and, you know, he's getting weaker and he's losing all his hair and he's in a wheelchair and he's just like, it's, it's just terrible. And he goes and, you know, he's sleeping most of the day, and, but he feels terrible. He sees his father is not working and it's all because of him. And he's thinking, what am I supposed to do? Like, what am I supposed to do? I, I feel so bad. And he says, you know what? Sukkot is coming up. I'll make a decoration for the sukkah. So he goes and he uh, starts, uh, you know, scribbling and he's so weak and he's so tired and his hands shake and he, it looks like he just had a seizure with a pen on and, when he, and he goes to his father after hours and hours of working on this and he goes to his father and says, Dad, look what I made for the sukkah and he shows him this scribble with looks like, you know, you know, this ink spilled in it and the father takes it and he's like, he's like, wow, that's amazing. And he puts it up on the sukkah, and he's like, this made the sukkah. Well, the sukkah was nothing before this. Look at this beautiful picture. And he's praising this boy, like, look how amazing it is. And this boy is beaming from ear to ear. He's so happy. He's, he made the sukkah. He's like, look at you know, he really got one for it. He's like, I made the sukkah. And every time his, fr his, his father's friends came over, and he says, come, let me show you something. Look what my boy made. Look at that. Look, look how beautiful that is. That is so beautiful. And the guys were like, what is this, modern art or something? I'd be like, mm -hmm. it's so beautiful. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So beautiful. So he, the, he's, he's back, and this boy is He's happy. He's so happy at what he did. When we come to God and we do a little mitzvah, we made a little bracha. We made a little bracha before we ate. God is gathering. Angels, come around. Look at what my boy did. We're sick. We're with chemo with all the sins that we have. And we're losing everything. We're so dirty. And then we do one mitzvah. And God says, look at what my, look at what my child did. Look at that. That's awesome. And everybody's looking around and he made a little bracha. And God's like, look at that. That is amazing. He made my world. He made my world for just for that bracha, just for that learning one hour of Torah, he made it. If we're coming to Rosh Hashanah and you're thinking, okay, I'm not able to change. You could. Everybody could change something. You could change something small. You take something small and you stick to it. That is so important. You take something that you could do and you stick to it no matter what. Whether it be the Katamazon, you're going to start uh, reading it inside slowly. You're going to learn how to read. You're going to learn how to do that. You're going to start being more meticulous on Shabbat. You're going to start learning extra every single day. Something. You do something and you stick with it. You're coming into Rosh Hashanah. You're a changed person. It might have been a little change, but you're a changed person. You're coming changed. You're coming as a new person. And you're coming to God, and God's not going to be like, who are you? I've never seen you before. And be like, no, this is my son. This is, the, this is my daughter. This is the one who changed. This man, this person changed the world. This person made the world. You come with such, and you're going to have an amazing judgment. You're going to have an unbelievable judgment. Now, with the last few minutes that we have, is I just want to, I want to share with you this, this devoutal I heard from Rabbi Wallerstein many, many years ago. I was a Chaya Wallstein. And it was so unbelievable that I had to write it down. And every year I read it. And every year, it's like, wow, this is amazing. I think it's from 2000, back from 2007. And the question that he asked, and it's a very, very, you know, what's this whole Yehi Ratzon that we're making on Rosh Hashanah? We go on Rosh Hashanah, 
and we're eating these food, and we're saying, I'm, dip the, I'm dipping the apple in the honey, so I should have a sweet ear, right? Oh, well, you, eat the, you eat the apple. I'm eating this, so I should be full of mitzvot. I'm eating this, so I shouldn't have any bad decrees. What, I never knew there was a shortcut to Judaism. But like, why are we doing mitzvot? Let's just eat the fruit. Be like, oh, I'll be a head and not a tail. Oh, all right, now I'm a leader. Oh, I mean, what is this? What, what, what is it that all of a sudden, like, there's a shortcut. You eat this, and you make this, this uh, all the simanim, and all of a sudden, that's it. Your year is amazing. Oh, no, uh, come on, I ate a pomegranate at 613, mitzvot, full of mitzvot, like me, uh, that. All of a sudden, you don't have to do anything. So the question is twofold. The question is, what are we doing over here? And if it's so important, let us do it every day. Why are we doing only Rosh Hashanah? So he says this amazing story, and he brings a story from the uh, Dibna Magen, mm -hmm. and he says like this. And he says that there was, uh, there was once a duke, and this duke was very, very wealthy, and he had a trusty servant who always was with him with, when everyone. And the duke was thinking out loud to the servant. He says, listen, you know, it's coming our 25th year anniversary between me and my wife. What am I going to do for this 25, you know, 25 year? And he's thinking, and he's racking, and he's like saying, you know, jewelry, perfume, blah, blah, blah. He's like, no, 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 something has to be different. So, so the duke, you know, here is, you know, there's in, a, in a very far away uh, town, there is a, there's a pet storm that sells this extremely, extremely rare bird. This bird is so rare, it costs about $5,000 just to get this bird, and it's not always there. And there was no phone calls. And what was so special about this bird is that it sings so beautifully. Like, you know, and it's a tiny bird that sings so beautifully. And his, his wife was very musically talented, and she always enjoyed music. And he's thinking, you know what? I'm gonna travel 10 days each way just to see if there is there. He gets, he gets his, his trusty servant, and he says, listen, I decided what I'm gonna buy my wife. I'm gonna buy her this amazing bird. And he's like, all right, sounds good. And he traveled 10 days, 10 days there. They go over there and they say, uh, he, goes, he goes into the pet store and he says, do you have this bird? I think it's called a Myra bird or something like that. And he's like, and the pet owner says, wow, that's crazy. He says, yeah, we just, I actually happened to have it two weeks ago. I usually don't get these things. They're very rare. And he says, great, I'll take it. He says, you know, that's about five grand for this little bird. And he says, no problem. He takes out a lot of cash, gives him the five grand, and he takes the bird. And this whole time the servant's looking at him and be like, wow, this tiny bird, you know, if he traveled 10 days to it and 10 days back, that's ridiculous. It must taste so good. So he's like, this is crazy. He goes and he, and he traveled back. And meanwhile, the servant is coming up with his 20-year anniversary. So he's thinking, he's like, listen, he's like, he's like, I want to do something so special for my 20-year anniversary. And my duke, my master, is so smart that if he traveled 10 days just to get this bird, it must be worth it. And he starts borrowing money from all his friends, five grand, and he travels back. He takes off 20 days from work, and he travels 10 days uh, there to the pet store. He goes to the pet store and he buy, He says, do you have this bird? And he's like, he's like, this is great. I just got in the bird today. He says, that's unbelievable how you guys, I, use, I get maybe a few of them a year. He's like, yeah, you want it? Five grand. He says, you got it. Five grand, he takes it and he runs and he goes home to his parents, uh, to, his, to his wife. He goes over to his wife and he says to his wife, before even he goes, he says anything, he says, happy anniversary, honey. I bought you the most amazing gift, anything. And he takes off this bird, this cage and he whips off the thing and she's, there's a little bird sitting there. And she's like, oh, uh, it's a bird. And he's like, no, 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 not just any bird. He says, this bird, the duke went and spent 10 days traveling just for this bird. This bird must taste so delicious. And the wife says, but it's so small. He says, the duke did it. You know, it must be, it, you, got, you got to do it. She's like, all right. You know, she goes and she kills it and she cooks it. And, uh, and they're sitting there for that, you know, they put out nice wine, nice tablecloth, they'll get there. They come out, you know, it's, it's this big. And, you know, when you cook it, it's like this big. So it's like a bite size. Be like, I was like two and a half thousand dollars per bite. And, you know, so they go and they bite it and it's broad. They spit it out. This is disgusting. And he's just screaming at her, how'd you cook it? It's like, what do you mean? I cook, I cook everything else. I'm put spice and I put it in the bottle. And he's screaming at her, you did it wrong. And she's screaming back at him. And he's like, something's wrong over here. He says, let me go run back to the, back to the Duke. And he goes back to the Duke and he's like, Duke, you got to help me. He says, how did you cook the bird? And he's like, what bird? He's like, the Meyer bird. I, I, I bought it for my wife and we cooked it and it's just terrible. And the guy just mouth dropped open. He's like, you did what? He's like, yeah, well, you know, we bought it. I thought it was so nice to have my wife. I bought it. It tastes disgusting. I can't believe I spent five grand in it. And he's like, you fool. He says, the bird is not meant for cooking. The bird is meant for singing. He says, what do you do about it? And this is what people come. They come and they think they eat a Rosh Hashanah to see money. And they think that, oh, because they ate this, they're going to have a sweet year. You're messing it up. You're, you, you're, getting the, you're getting the wrong point. You're missing the point completely. The point is not for that. The point is for the bracha. We come into this world... What are we coming to this world for? One of the main things we're coming for is we're raising things from a, from a physical level to a spiritual level. You're taking this and you're making a bracha on this. You're taking it from a physical thing and you're raising it to a spiritual thing. You come out of the bathroom, one of the lowest things I've heard that a human does, and you're raising the lowest thing, you say, and you're making it into a spiritual thing. Well, it says, 
Olam Chesed Yibane. The world is built on kindness. You know what kindness that we're doing? We are constantly taking things on the physical platform and moving it up to the spiritual platform. That is what we're doing. And that is what we're doing. When we're saying the Bachot, what are we saying? We're saying, no, 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 the Simanim. What does the Simanim mean? Simanim means, like, we're, we're doing our job. We're taking the physical and we're raising it up to the spiritual. That is what we're doing. And that's why if you go and you make and you eat without making a Bachot, it's considered as if you stole. Like, well, you're not doing your job, God says. I put you over here. I put this apple over here, right? There's, maybe there's even a soul inside the apple. And there's a tikkun that you have to make. When do you make the, when you make the bracha? You're doing chesed. You're doing chesed for the, for, the, for, the, for the soul over there. So now the question, and this is the final thing that we'll end with, is why bee, honey? Why? If you ever think about it, bee is not kosher. You can't eat a bee. But yet, it's derivative. The honey is kosher. How could it be something that's not kosher, can take something out that is kosher. It makes absolutely no sense. So there's, there's, many, there's many honey. You can take date honey. Why, why specifically bee honey? So there is, um, so he answered like, the, you know, Rabzachai Walsing. This is also what, what, the other thing that he said. And I, I could say this every year, and it just, this is just so awesome. It's just so, you don't even, it's unbelievable. Listen to this. He says, uh, um, you know, what does a bee do all day? It literally it does, it pollinates the world. It literally, what it does, it like, it's, it's a worker for God. It helps God pollinate the world, right? And if not for bees, it will, we will be in a very, very bad situation. Bees help the fruits and the whatever, the, however the, the pollen works, but they, they pollinate the world. So they spent the entire life just working for God, doing chesed for God. And God says, how this, per, even though it's not kosher, but it's so, such a pure, such a pure bird, such a pure fly, I mean, that how can I make something that comes out of it not kosher? But just the opposite. I'm going to make it come kosher. So why do we go and we eat it? It says, we, what we are doing is throughout the entire year, we do many sins and we do many unfortunate things. But there's one thing that we're, we're always doing chesed. We're always doing kindness. Like we said before, olam chesed yibane. We're raising things to the spiritual level. We're always doing the chesed. We're telling God, listen, we might be impure like the bee, but look at what we're doing all day. We're trying to help pollinate your world. We're going and we're raising things from the spiritual level. We're just doing chesed all the time. So that's why we dip the apple in the honey, specifically the bee honey. Why the bee honey? Because just like us, we're filthy, we're dirty with so many sins, but we're constantly doing chesed. We're constantly trying to, to, to just help other people. This is, what, this, is, this is why we dip it specifically in bee honey. And this is why specifically well, we're doing this. And, and, and let me just end with this. What is the biggest chesed that a person could do? The biggest chesed that a person could do is help somebody else in religion. Help somebody else come back. They're not, bring them to Shio Torah. Give them, send them a lecture. Send them a, just send, be like, hey, I saw, I heard this lecture. This guy is hilarious. He screams, he cries, whatever it is. That, you know, you find this guy's very interesting. Send, shoot them, shoot them a private message. Be like, yeah, I'll listen to it maybe sometime. And, you know, that is the biggest kindness that you could do to the person. You could save a person's soul. You could save a person's soul. And not only that, you'll also save his life over here. And this Rosh Hashanah, may I bless all of you and everybody watching and everybody listening that we should always have a, an amazing, amazing year. An Amen. amazing, unbelievable, successful year. Amen. And this Rosh Hashanah will come to Rosh Hashanah, will come with change. We'll be like, listen, God, I did one thing different this year. I did, you know, it's been a few days to Rosh Hashanah. I'm going to change one thing. I'm going to come to Rosh Hashanah as a change man. I'm going to come to Rosh Hashanah and be like, oh, I know this guy. He's been here before. Yeah, let him right into the front. We're going to be those people. And this Rosh Hashanah will have an amazing and a successful year. Amen. Amen.